All right, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, have Jeff Walker here, uh, professor at UCSD. Uh, I think uh, everyone knows who he is. He, uh, he has a, uh, he's done an immense amount of uh, impactful work in, uh, in the area of security. Uh, very recently, he uh, was awarded the Test of Time Award at USENIC Security, and also last year he became an ACM Fellow. Um, uh, Jeff has had a long history with us at Microsoft. He's a friend of ours. Uh, he was the first uh, intern in the systems group here at MSR. Um, since then, he has had a lot of interaction with us, um, both directly and also indirectly with his, uh, through his students who have uh, come and spent a lot of time with us. And Jeff has also spent almost an entire year in MSR India. And um, so it's, it's a great pleasure to have our friend here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharad. All right, is the, are you guys hearing through the mic? Great. Ah, it's fantastic to be here. Um, it's always fun to come back uh, to, to MSR. Um, you know, I have many, many great memories, you know, going all the way back to when I was an intern, when everything was just getting started here. And then even when I was a super green professor, um, just starting out UCSD, Victor helped me out a lot with uh, both support and advice and mentorship. So, you know, I have a very close and, and personal history with Microsoft. Um, what I want to do today is um, talk about some relatively recent work that uh, we've been doing um, in sort of this cybercrime space. Uh, we call it evidence-based security. And um, we have this, we call this center because um, the NSF style funding that it is, but it's essentially a, um, a large grant from NSF to do cybercrime related research. Um, and this is something that uh, we also work very closely with uh, Vern Paxson at Berkeley, um, going all the way back to, to Weilang um, in previous projects. And um, you know, the, the style of security work that, that we wound up doing over time sort of evolved into this style where, roughly speaking, we do a tremendous amount of measurement to be able to understand the problem, the attackers, what they're doing, how they're impacting users or infrastructure or whatever it is they're doing. And then um, when thinking about how to both understand and potentially undermine and deal with um, some style of abuse or large-scale attack, to also not just think about technical approaches, but also sort of the economics and, and social aspects of, of the attack as well as additional leverage for trying to, to impact what's going on. And then finally, to, to engage with attackers where possible. And so you know, sort of in the set of work that we've done, the stuff that's probably most well known that we've given lots of talk about is all this spam work, um, where we, you know, going after email spam and eventually search spam, and we bought a lot of drugs for science and all this crazy stuff. Um, but in reality, actually, we've done lots of different things over time, many, many different kinds of, of cybercrime-related work. Um, I, the stuff that I highlighted in blue are, are actually projects that we work together with, with Microsoft. Um, we have a number of projects that we've done with SciCat in, in particular, but also the Digital Crime Unit um, when we were doing all of that, that email spam and, and stuff like that. Um, so it's been great working with, uh, with Microsoft on, on these style of projects as well. So for today, I wanted to cover sort of two two relatively recent projects. Um, they're not necessarily tied together directly, um, except that they're relatively recent. One is on something that we call Tripwire, which is sort of a mechanism for being able to infer site compromise externally as a third party. And then the second is an effort um, looking at, you know, the main motivation is to sort of foundations for looking at abuse related to DNS, um, but starting out by exploring what has happened with, with the introduction of all of these new top-level domains in, in DNS. And if there's additional time, probably not, because I stuck a lot of slides in here, I can talk about sort of where we're going from here. And at any point, um, you know, please feel free to stop me if you have questions. It's much more fun for me um, if it's a sort of interactive style talk. Okay. So I'll start with the first project, um, which was led by our student, Joe de Blasio. Um, this, we had this system called Tripwire for being able to infer site compromise. And you know, data breaches and site compromises are all over the news. Um, 
you know, lots of everybody has been compromised, and I can absolutely guarantee you that UCSD has been compromised many times over. Um, and you know, one question is sort of, you know, how many compromises are there out there? What is the rate? Who is being compromised? Potentially, why? Um, all these interesting questions. Um, the challenge is trying to measure this stuff externally because nobody wants to admit that they've been compromised. It's sort of, to me, it's analogous. To, we did this very early work back in 2001 looking at denial of service attacks. Nobody wants to admit they're being attacked, but can you come up with ways to infer this um, externally? And so the idea that we had was that um, we can get insight into c compromises at sites um, through the fact that people reuse their passwords. OK, so you know, the general idea is that you know, for any arbitrary site out there, let's say it's even some hobby site, users will sign up. The site will ask the users for their email address and then a password. And that may be the credentials that they'll use to log into the site. And the reason why attackers might break into a site, compromise it, and then use the email account and the password, why it might have value to them is because if there is password reuse, then they can go and try to log into the email account of that user. So they breach some other site over there, which then lets them leapfrog into the webmail account. And then they have all of these sort of assets associated with that email account that they can mine and try to monetize. So there's actually a lot of value. And so when there are site compromises and data breaches, particularly of the credentials, attackers will routinely just take all of the, the email accounts that they find and the passwords and just try to see if they can log into the email account. And if so, they will use it directly or resell those email accounts in bulk to other attackers. There's a lot of value in attackers being able to do this. OK, so then this sort of suggests a technique for being able to um, detect site compromise externally. So what I'll do is talk about sort of the, the methodology that we used, and then a study that we did over the span of about a year and a half, talk about the, the compromises that we detected. And then we did an additional step where we contacted all the sites where we detected compromise and sort of interacted with them about what it is that they found. And um, it was actually pretty eye-opening, that, that disclosure step. Wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. Is it like a, you, you create a honey account? Uh, exactly. Great. Okay. So with this, the idea is is actually very straightforward. We're just going to partner with a large webmail provider who has to remain anonymous, and we're just going to create a whole bunch of honey email accounts. And the, we're going to use those email accounts one to one with sites out on the internet. And then we'll just wait. Let's wait, wait, wait. Eventually, an attacker will compromise one of these sites. We don't know which one. We're just going to wait. And then they'll try to log into our account at the email provider. And then the email provider is going to be monitoring all these accounts and will notify us if there are any login attempts, whether they're successful or not. And then potentially even monitor the activity of what happens to those accounts when somebody logs in. OK? That's the general idea. Very do, straightforward. Do you make the passwords especially easy or something to ensure that you were you? <laughs> Great question, and I'll give you, you know, five dollars. Okay, so we, when we registered accounts at the sites, we actually registered two accounts, one account that had an easy to guess password, and another account that had a hard to crack password. And then when we looked to see if there were login attempts to our accounts, we looked to see whether or not the attackers were able to get into the easy account and get into the hard account. And if they were able to get into the hard account, then that means that site did not do a good job of securing passwords. They were either in the clear or very easily reverse engineered using rainbow tables or any you know, standard method out there. So it lets us differentiate and get some insight into sort of the security practices <coughs> of the site. Great question. Exactly. Um, doing this for one or two sites, very straightforward. So one of the technical challenges was scaling this up so that we could just go down lots of different sites and try to <coughs> register accounts with them. Um, and so a lot of the work that Joe had to do was sort of building an automated crawler to be able to identify an account registration page, parse everything, and then sign up for the account get the email message to confirm the registration, click on that, and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, you know, the, the actual the pages tend to be written in such a way to make it hard to automate that, because in a way, you know, large scale account sign up is not necessarily something that we want to encourage or make easy. <laughs> um, and then. Uh, we also supplemented uh, the automated crawler, which is going down the, the site of the top Alexa and just doing manual registrations if the crawler failed. And then at the, the webmail provider, we generated the profiles for all of the accounts, the passwords, and the, the account usernames. And then we would just give that information to the webmail provider, and then they would just create accounts for us in bulk. The webmail provider did not know which accounts we had used at, or even which sites those, those accounts were associated with. And what was nice about that is that in the end, we had about um, 100,000 of these Honeypot accounts that we didn't sign up anywhere. And they were never accessed which gave us a pretty good indication that the webmail provider was not breached. So uh, having our accounts logged into was not a result of the webmail provider itself um, actually getting breached. OK, so then um, we have this crawler. We just go down the, the Alexa rankings, trying to identify sites that we can register at. Um, for the, the sites that actually had you know, registration pages, we succeeded, the, the automated crawler succeeded reasonably well, but um, it was focused on English sites. There are actually a lot of non-English sites in the, in the top um, Alexa. And then um, some sites that uh, were very difficult to do and uh, just using an automated crawler. So um, of those sites, you, mm -hmm. said you succeeded about 20% of the time. When you failed, um, was it credit card? They just required a credit card or? It was all sorts of different things. So um, they might ask for a credit card. It might be an, a very advanced CAPTCHA where, so to solve CAPTCHAs, we would just you know, list a CAPTCHA solving service and pay them. And some of those just couldn't handle the, the interface of using the service couldn't handle the, the advanced CAPTCHAs. Sometimes sites will ask for one bit of information on one page, make you click, go to another page, enter in the next bit of information, and so on and so forth. And so this multi-step. Um, there are sites out there. So for example, um, you know, let's say for uh, you know, power utility sites. It's like there's an account there, but the only way in which you can get it, actually log in and register is if you actually have some kind of relationship with them already. You can't just arbitrarily. So uh, the, the bottom line was that there are lots of different reasons why the, the automated crawler would fail. The, the, the power company is an ineligible case? It would be an ineligible case, yeah. yeah. So in the end, we were able to successfully register on um, 2,300 sites, which was less than we thought we were going to be able to do um, going into the project, um, but still sort of is a reasonably sized number. And then. If you studied this over, if you would study this over a period of time, mm -hmm. would you start to see that it's getting harder or easier? I would hope harder to create such accounts. I think it's harder. So the number of 23, like for example, if you start to study again for another two years, it should come down to, which is a good thing, right? Which is a good thing. But at the same time, if we invested more effort in our crawler, then we could sort of take, take into account and deal with more sophisticated ways of registering accounts. So I think, I think we could still sort of maintain it. I guess my point was that, um, so I'm sort of thinking like a long time back, you might remember when we were sort of thinking about Wi-Fi, right? Like mm -hmm. there were, everything was accessible, mm -hmm. but then everything came with a default password, so it became difficult. Mm -hmm. But then everything was, you know, so eventually, like, it kept going down and down. And so then compromising it became harder. And so there was a lot of papers written in the past saying that, hey, you can connect and you can do yeah, all this, yeah. like, thing. But now, you, now you it's know, not even an issue. All of that stuff is just gone. I don't think this is going to go away um, because the sort of the counterbalance is, is that sites in general don't want to make it too hard for people to register accounts. Right. Um, and particularly if you're not a top site. You, so you don't want to make it hard and push people away because you want to attract people. So that's why I think it's going to balance out. Okay. 
the end result of doing the monitor is that we, de we detected 19 site breaches, which is almost 1% of the sites that we were monitoring, um, which is actually more than I thought we were going to detect. Um, OK, so now I'll talk a little bit about sort of characteristics of the sites that, that we did detect the breaches at. So these are tables we just letter the, the sites, A through S. Um, the check mark in the hard column means that the honeypot account that we had associated with the site, the attacker was able to log in using the hard password. So that meant you know, bad, um, bad practices on the site. This is the, the Alexa ranking, sort of modulo 500, and then sort of the, the category of the, the style of site that, that, that we see. Um, one nice little bit of validation was that, so for all of these sites, they had not been confirmed to ever have been compromised, except for bitcointalk.org. Um, they went public about being compromised, and we had already had a honeypot account, and we were able to confirm that exactly when they said they were compromised, sure enough, you know, the next day, somebody logged into our email account. And, um, you know, they were very clear about sort of what their practices were um, in managing accounts, and they did a good job in, in keeping passwords um, encrypted, and so we did not see um, a login to our, our hard account, hard password account. So what's the question mark? The question mark here is that due to methodological issues, we only registered an easy password account on that site. We did not register a hard one. That we did not. We only discovered that afterwards, and so we don't know. That's why I leave it a question mark. So, so when you have a check, um, that means the hard one was logged. In each of the cases where the hard password was tried, was the easy one also tried? On in general, yes. Both were tried. Not always, but in general, yes. <coughs> so what, why, what, um, why, why would one and not the other if it's? Yeah, if they're going through all of the accounts sort of systematically, why wouldn't they do all of them? I, I don't have a good answer for that. I think there was one situation, one of the sites where the easy account was not logged into. Mm -hmm. so, so just a clarification. So when, when um, there is a compromise using a hard password, you were able to verify that they weren't just like doing brute force attack yes. on all hard passwords. It was just, there was just one login attempt with the exact password. Yeah. yeah. These were not brute forced. Okay. But, but, but the ones the where there isn't a hard check mark, they, they tried to brute force, like you could, you could see the brute force attack? They were not doing any. They were not brute forcing account logins at the webmail provider. Okay. What they were doing is they would take the password database offline, and then they would brute force it offline, and then they would um, just use what it is they discovered as a single login attempt. Successful. So, so for the twenty three hundred websites, mm -hmm. uh, was there any uh, public uh, compromise that? Uh, among them that you have account and you didn't see the email account was used? Ah, so there were no, there were no sites that had declared themselves as being compromised where we had an account and did not see it. So there were no, we didn't miss anything, there were no false negatives. Yeah, we didn't miss anything. Could you be talking more about what about these sites, you know, yeah. in terms of why they... Yeah. And it's, you know, it's easy to imagine that sort of a random hobby site out there um, doesn't have good security practices and can be breached. Um, but four of the sites were in the Alexa top 500 in their home country. Um, so even top sites, like the, the first one, top 500 Alexa ranking, um, billion dollar company, and the hard, hard password account was accessed. And then, um, for these two, they wound up being the, the same company, totaling, you know, comprising about 30 million users. Um, but only, only the easy password was accessed there. OK, yes? So when the easy password was accessed, your, your, your hypothesis is that it was, so it was just a, uh, an online guessing attack at, the, at the, the site in question, right? Offline guessing until they had figured out um, passwords, and then they would just use those passwords at the webmail provider. For the weak password? For the, for the weak password, yes. So 
So wh uh, wh why wouldn't you assume that it was an online, just a, a, a you know, a guessing attack against the server, and there was no there was no compromise other than like could, how weak were those passwords? I see. So the question is, for the sites that were compromised, were those sites brute forced externally? No. The question is, for for the ones for, for the sites where the weak the weak account was was taken. Are you yeah. are you saying that? It was. It, it, are, are you um, suggesting that it was that that account was compromised because somebody guessed and the password was so easy that it was guessable online, or that there was a breach of the server and they got and they did not like? So that would be a possibility, which is that the account was so easy yep. that they would just go to the webmail provider and just use guess very simply that they could just log in. Yep. Um, there are two reasons why we don't think that was the case. The first is, is that the webmail provider checked to see if there was any sort of brute force attempts on any of the accounts, multiple logins before it actually was successful. No, but, uh, but they, online, they, online attack at the at the site. At the site, not the. Not they the would have had to guess his randomly generated email address as well as the webmail. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm getting. That's what I'm getting. So all of our email addresses are private. Okay, and they were and they're not super discoverable. No. Okay, so they are themselves strong strengths. Yes. Yes. Exactly. All right. So this is this just shows sort of from a, a timeline perspective what the login activity is across the different sites. So this is time on the x-axis. The different sites are each each a row going across, and then we have two dots: an open circle for easy, um, orange for hard, and it just shows you over time what the login activity across the different sites were. How many times? And then the number in parentheses on the, on the right Y is the number of logins per site. These are email logins. Yes. Yes. So these are attackers logging into our email accounts at the webmail provider using one of the, the two different and passwords. And when did you ask? So 715 is your first? Yes. And uh, when did you first set this whole thing up? Uh, 7.15, I think, was three months after we started. So what do you think happened for three months, not nothing? Well we, did have a, well, we did have a gap in that, uh, um, in that period where it could have been that their um, accounts had been compromised and we didn't detect it. I have no good explanation for, but it, it's, you know, this, we sorted them by time of first account access. Mm -hmm. And you do see that you know there are gaps in of months before we detect another another compromise. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be in, in the months time frame. It's kind of weird how it is. There's almost like a line when the compromise has started. <laughs> anyway. I, yeah, I don't want to yeah. read too much in the tea leaves. What are they doing when they log in? Are they sending spam? So this. I, I thought this was going to be an interesting part of the study, which is looking to see what the attackers did with the accounts, and it wound up being an uninteresting part of the study. There were a few where the automated systems at the webmail providers just shut down the accounts because they were sending out spam. But by and large, they would log in, look around, and just not do much. And they're doing this multiple times. So I, I just don't know. I, I think. In the email inbox. We did not. We did not. But it's clear that they were logging in repeatedly, perhaps to test to see whether or not the password had been changed and whether the inventory was still alive. Was the webmail provider a, a top tier one? Yes. Yes. Well, c could it be that um, they were just checking the liveness of the account so yes. that they can sell it? Yes, that's my. It's that's a verified account with the, the working password. That's the best hypothesis I can think of for the activity that we saw. I thought we were going to be able to watch all this you know, crazy stuff going on with the accounts. It wound up being totally uninteresting. And what's special about M? Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so there are a couple where there's just crazy stuff going on in terms of the accounts, and the number of, um, the number of log the time between logins is very, very short. I don't know. One hypothesis is, is that those credentials were given to lots of different people, and so you just saw lots of different people trying over time. Yeah. So the numbers on the right, are they about unique email accounts or unique websites? or is The numbers on the right are the number of unique <coughs> login, successful logins to the email accounts associated with these sites. Under, like, 
under this theme? Because I, I thought you registered a lot of email accounts, so is it under the same account? Um, the same account. So just to be very concrete, for A, we saw we had two accounts and we saw two logins, one to the easy, one to the hard, and then we never saw logins again. And then um, for N, which had you know, 570, again, we just had two accounts, but we saw 570 logins to those accounts. Why did you not register a more hard and more easy <coughs> accounts? Why did you just limit it to one? So the, um, it's a good question. The value in registering more would be greater confidence that the attackers were just going through the entire password database. But the flip side is, is that we wanted to minimize harm, so to speak, to the sites under question, because we didn't ask them if we could register Honey accounts with them. We were just doing that. And so minimizing resources and impact on them for the work that we were doing wanted us to, led us to minimize the number of accounts that we had. The reason I'm asking is it's interesting that one of them had a lot of hard uh, logins, but no single easy login they are, right? Yeah. So, the one question I think. So um, you saw, like, you look, look at him. You saw first compromise around six sixteen, mm -hmm. and you didn't want that their site, and they kept compromising till two seventy over. Okay, so what I so have not plotted is when it was that we notified. For some of the sites, um, it took us a little while to notify, um, and the reason why was that. Um, the webmail provider was doing this for us as a favor, and um, it required somebody's time and intervention to go in and actually collect log data and send it to us. And that only happened on occasion, so there was a delay in some times um, between when we got it and when we'd notify, things like that. Yeah. But it, it is also the case that um, for some of the sites we re-registered you know, for all these sites, we re-registered re new accounts to see if there was subsequent um, compromises. And in some of the sites' cases, that did happen. So did you do any study of whether or not they were mining the inbox itself once they logged in? We, we could not get information, detailed information about what they were doing with the inbox. And we had not, um, we had not salted the inbox with that much information. Because the challenge is, because we had created, I don't know, 200,000 accounts, something like that. And doing that at scale winds up being very difficult. We did create realistic profiles for all the individuals. So we had names, addresses, all of that stuff was, um, was all valid. But the inbox itself was uninteresting. How about Outbox? I'm sorry? Outbox, did they use you to send email to somebody? Um, some of them did, and there were a couple where they were sending spam at such a rate that automated systems for the webmail provider just shut down the account even without our intervention. Um, but by and large, there was very, very little activity out of the accounts. I was expecting much more, but they were not being, not being used. Okay. So then... Once we had gathered this information and then sort of rolling over time, um, when we discovered a site was compromised, we would notify the site and we would look to try to find the appropriate contact addresses. We'd send them email and um, wait for a response. And whenever we got a response, and for large sites we got an immediate response, um, not just from engineering but also from legal, and um, we were immediately as helpful as possible explaining what we did, what we found, all this kind of stuff. Um, but it led to some interesting conversations, um, which provide some insight into some of these sites. So I'll just go through some examples. So I, I, I do want to preface this that you know, there was a part of me that was actually feeling pretty bad when interacting with these folks because we were telling them that we had been, they had been compromised, but we had no insight how or why they were compromised. All we could do was detect. It's like, ah, you've been owned. Good luck. Um, so it's, it puts them in a slightly awkward position. Um, only a third of the sites actually wound up responding to us, but all of the big sites, well, the majority of the big sites um, did. In the end, though, 
um, even based upon what we were able to tell them, uh, no sites ever notified users, and no sites forced a password reset um, on the accounts at their site. So it was not enough to, to get them to do anything, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the summary. So on your on you notifying them, did any of the sites inform you that it was against the policy for you to even set up such no. crap accounts? No. Because they shut down your account at all? So um, it could be that the acceptable use policy at the site um, said, oh, you cannot use an automated system to register an account. And then when we notified them, their response might be, hey, what are you doing? We told you, you know, our acceptable use policy says you're not supposed to be doing that. What are you doing? Nobody went down that path. Another part of it is uh, if uh, I'm a big company, I really have to take your words and say, oh, this account was never used, uh, only stored here. Yes. Right? I could be very well just say, ah, you use somewhere and it was leaked, uh, not from us. So why do I should uh, tell the 100 million users just because yeah. one of them, right? Yeah. So we'll talk about the, the top company in a second. OK, well, let's start small. So going into this, we fully expected that we would, we would find sites that were well down the Alexa rankings, that you know, it's run by you know, an individual or a small group of people. It's not as if they have the, a giant security team. And sure, you know, they would likely have lots of problems. And sure enough, yes, we did run into those problems and sites that had those problems. In interacting with them, you know, they would promise fixes soon, but never took action. And the bottom line is, is they're, they're too busy fighting other fires. So this was a great anecdote from one of the sites, which was, I was like, look, when we started this site, I used to have sysadmins, but they kept on telling me that I couldn't do things, so I fired them all. And that caused even more problems for me. <laughs> I was like, well, you know. Probably not surprising that, that this occurred. Okay? Um, for the large sites, they were very responsive, except for, for one. Um, and you know, we, we heard from different parts of the company, both engineering and, and legal. And for the, the very top site, the, the very big one, um, we had multiple phone calls with them with uh, um, where um, their lawyer just asks us a long series of questions. And the idea behind the questions, the goal behind the questions, was to try to find a weakness in our methodology such that they could point to that as being the explanation for the account compromise, not to the site being breached. Um, Joe is fantastic and handled that questioning like a pro, and they could not find a chink in the armor. Um, they still did not corroborate that there was a compromise. But when we at, the last question we would ask is, well, then what is another explanation for what it is that we found, given everything that, that we've discussed? And they would never answer the question. So um, for this outdoor site, it was a site that wound up being purchased. Go ahead. So there are some kind of uh, small companies that kind of go rummaging around on the dark web find stuff on Pastebin, and then contact companies saying, I've got evidence that you've been breached, you know, as a way of kind of like mm -hmm. trying to sell their consulting service. Yeah, did, FYI. Did, did, yeah, did, 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 you, did anyone kind of indicate or hint that they might have had, because th there's yes. a chance that there might have been other channels that yes. this would feed back. One of the sites knew they had been breached because somebody posted to their forum saying, hey, we breached and we duplicated your entire site and the alternate site is running over here in case you want to come over and use us. I think there's a separate kind of, I mean, I, maybe your stats is getting kind of a little too small. You're not 19, but it would be interesting to see all of those that are breached, assuming all of these are, what percent actually end up on kind of scrapable places like Pastebin as opposed to I'm going to use this for myself. And um, uh. Yeah. But, but, but I question the efficacy of, of those services because, like, for example, like uh, Microsoft employees, if you sign up for the, uh, for the legal plan, yeah. one of the things that they offer is to tell you if you're email account has been compromised. And the way that they do that is you enter in your personal email address, in my case it's shred at gmail.com, and then I regularly get like reports from them saying that we found a website where there was your email address and some password. Yeah, yeah. And they have no idea no, whether yeah, that yeah, password yeah. is correct or not. I, I question their right. privacy also. But so, it is, it is, like it, um, it's sort of <coughs> yeah, and I would say the lesson that we learned for the small sites is um, 
even if they are notified, whether it's from us or whether these other channels, um, it's not high enough on our priority to do something about it. They're, they're dealing with other fires. Yeah. So there's a database that does this called Have I Been Owned with a P.com yes. or net or something. And that actually works quite well because I generally use a unique email address for all these sites that I register with. And they tell me, like when I, the LinkedIn one and the Adobe one and all the ones that are known to have been compromised, I've received a notification through that. So my question is, have you considered cross-referencing your known hacked accounts with that database? No, that's a good question and we didn't do it, but it'd be a uh, good sign up. Yeah, with. very good thing to do. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so for this site, um, the site was purchased by a competing, a competing site. And at the, at the time the site was handed over to the competitor, that is when we saw the account being accessed from the original site. And so, who knows, you know, it might have been an insider thing, not necessarily an external site breach. Who knows what was going on there? And then for the, for the very top one, um, you know, this billion dollar company, 50 million users. So we, had, we did have um, extended conversations with them over time. Um, after we had gone through this sort of entire methodology and they, they couldn't find a, a flaw, the next call that we had with them is they said that they had hired a, um, a third party incident response team to review everything and review their internals. And the third party team found no, no indication of site compromise. But this was a site that at the time that our logins, we observed logins to our accounts, other users were complaining on Twitter that their logins on the site were compromised. And there was even a story in, in a newspaper about it, but the, the site denied the allegations that, that they were compromised. Um, so for this one, actually, we had some, some additional external um, validation that actually it wasn't just our accounts who they were compromised at this time. OK. An interesting side effect of this was that, if, particularly for this site, I was sort of waiting for something like this, sort of a, a legal document handed to us. And we did get a cease and desist order, but it wasn't from any of the sites that we monitored. It was from Tripwire Inc., who were very angry with us for calling our system Tripwire. <laughs> um, it's, like, it's just it's a name. We're not commercializing it. OK. so. The technique works. We did a pilot study, found you know, roughly 19 compromised sites, 1% of, of the sites that we were looking at it. Compromisers were happening at sites of, of all different scales. The small ones, not so surprising, but actually there were large ones that didn't have sort of the, the greatest practices. And none of, the, none of the sites did anything with their users as a result of this. And you know, there's, there's strong incentives not to state that your site has been compromised. And so you can imagine from their perspective, if they have been compromised, the risk, the impact on stock prices, all this kind of stuff of declaring that versus sort of a research team coming in and saying, look, we have no other explanation other than your site has been compromised with no additional information, that they're willing to take the risk to say that it didn't happen. So um, earlier, when you talked about the difference between uh, hard and easy passwords, um, the fact that somebody would log into one of your hard password sites, you said that that indicated that the server was potentially having bad password practices. But, but is that necessarily the case? In other words, once the site's compromised, depending on the nature of the compromise, I may be able to just observe people logging in now, admittedly, your your particular email account, nobody would have logged in. But are you are you sure that we can't be absolutely certain? So let's say it's the case that somebody installs malware. It's at the it's at the other end of the HTTPS connection, so they're actually able to see the you know the the authentication happen in real time as an RPC and whatever. That's potentially it. we were not logging to our account, so they probably wouldn't see ours. So it's hard to have that be an explanation for our accounts. Um, but that is very much a limitation with this technique, which is it gives us no insight into the compromise itself. So, so the, the following question is, would 
for, for sites that are interested in detecting their own compromise, would you recommend this technique to them? Yes, absolutely. Okay, all right. I clearly created way too many slides, but that's okay. I'm gonna transition a little bit um, in talking about sort of work that we've been doing looking at DNS, in particular the introduction of the new top-level domains. Um, and this is work that our student Tristan um, did as part of his dissertation. There are sort of two different stages of this work. And I will talk a little bit about the, the first one because I, I know already that I'm not gonna be able to get at the second one. All right, so. Here's the idea where, where we were coming from in starting this work. You know, DNS is absolutely critical infrastructure um, for the entire internet. It's how we name things on the internet. Um, but DNS domain names in particular wind up being, also being very essential for many different kinds of large scale abuse and attacks. Um, there's value in having domain names, particularly if they have reputation. So um, in a lot of the work that we did, um, we would look at domains and the use of domains sort of in the context of a particular attack. But um, the introduction of the new TLDs just completely changes the, the DNS landscape. And, um, and so we wanted to sort of get a sense for how this change would eventually impact abuse and attacks. And so we started by just looking at what was going on with the, the new TLDs. All right, so for some context, <laughs> Back when we were in graduate school, you know, you had seven TLDs in the country code TLDs. Now, 1,200 new generic TLDs. That's a lot. A lot. OK, what's going on with those new TLDs? What are they being used for? OK, so you know, we wanted to see to what extent, what, what impact these new TLDs are having on DNS. and are the, the introduction of the new TLDs sort of serving the stated purpose that they are introduced for? Are they meeting unmet needs that the lack of those TLDs had? And our approach to sort of doing this foundation was to examine one new TLD in detail, and then all new TLDs that were registered by the end of 2014, so at the time of this study, it was 500 TLDs. And we just look at all domains, crawl their content, so on and so forth. Okay, and then our ongoing work is sort of looking at um, you know, analyzing DNS from a global perspective to look for abuse and attacks and, and weird ways in which DNS is being used. Okay, so I will, I will focus on, on this first one because it is, again, a very interesting story, um, which is the triple X TLD. All right. It's an unusual TLD in many ways, and it has a very storied history. Um, it's a TLD specialized for adult contact. Um, the registry that proposed it was ICM registry. And they sort of had a story for what the value of the domain was and all this kind of stuff. But there was lots of criticism all over the place. And actually, even the adult entertainment industry did not want .XXX DLD to be created. Okay, so ICANN, for various reasons, approved it in 2005. And then the Governmental Advisory Council part of ICANN wrote a report saying, this is a terrible idea, don't do it. So ICANN said, oh, okay, fine, we won't do it. So they rejected it. And then ICM Registry filed a complaint. An independent review board upheld ICM Registry's complaint. And so ICANN said, oh, okay, I guess we have to do it after all. And then it became active in 2011. Okay, so there was a story for what I, XXX was for. Um, and it, it represents one of these early new generic top-level domains. And so we wanted to see to what was the impact of, of XXX. So we would just enumerate all the registered domains. Um, it turns out that because of how XXX works, it requires some inference. It's not just sort of enumerating the zone file, although that's one of the steps. Crawl the content. And then based upon what it is that we could discover about the domain, we tried to infer the registration to intent of the domain in XXX. What it, why did that person, that individual register that domain. Then we would also estimate the costs and the revenue as a result of the domain registrations to ICM registry. How much money is ICM registry making as a result? Okay, the registration process for this winds up being unusually complicated. There are these things, it started with this rollout period and so um, 
ICM Registry, since it was a new opening up new territory, new name territory, it wanted to try to capitalize on new names being available. And so it had a premium for people to register new names. So some of the, one part of that premium is for people who might want domains in XXX, at Sunrise A. And then there are people who don't want to have domains in XXX. And so there was another period where you could pay money so that nobody else could grab that domain for you. So this, in this period, Microsoft could register Microsoft.XXX so that nobody else could register Microsoft.XXX for obvious reasons. OK. And then um, there's a whole set of names that are protected. So for example, all US presidents, senators, congressmen, blah, 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 all of their names are protected. Can't register them. And then finally, after all this auctioning and all this crazy stuff happening, then they open it up to sort of general registrations. OK. And then these are, these are the prices for registering the domain. All right. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to enumerate all the domains in XXX, crawl them, find out, and then eventually try to infer the intent. Zone file gives you all the domains that are registered and resolving. And then there are a bunch of names that are hidden. They're not in the zone file. They're just hidden because they're reserved or non-resolving, things like that. And so um, we would have to sort of infer counts and guess at what these domains might be to try to get a sense of the, the numbers there. Um, for the domains where we could cr crawl them, um, we downloaded both their web content, of course, all of their um, DNS records, as well as who is records, and try to use this as a way for inferring registration intent. OK, so this is what happens if you go to Microsoft.XXX. You get this page that pops up that says this domain has been reserved for registration. So Microsoft paid $200 in Sunrise B so that nobody else could register XXX, Microsoft.XXX, including Microsoft. So Microsoft cannot use this domain. All right? it's, and this web page is served out of ICM Registry, which is a registry that, that owns XXX. So the intent here is to reserve names and essentially protect you from from other people registering it. There's another way in which sites, organizations, people can protect themselves from other people registering them. And it's the category is called registered non-resolving. So for example, if you look up UCSD.XXX, so we pay money, UCSD pays money to ICM registry. For UCSD.XXX, you'll get a non-existent domain. So UCSD pays money on a yearly basis to ICM registry so that if anybody tries to look it up, it says the domain is non-existent. And roughly speaking, so it, it, you can't enumerate these. There's no way to enumerate them because they're not in a zone file or anything like that. And so you have to try to sort of guess what their, what their numbers are. And roughly speaking, the amount in this category, at least in the first year, is roughly speaking the, the same amount in the reserved category like Microsoft's case. And the intent here is clearly to be defensive. You don't want somebody else registering it, so you're willing to pay money so that they can't. And then there are two other categories. One is speculative. So these are people who are registering domains because they believe that they'll be able to sell it at a higher price to somebody else who wants it down the line. So parking pages. So this is an example of a parking page of a domain in XXX. They're just, it's up there. The domain has been registered. It resolves. If you visit it in the browser, they just want to sell it to you. So it's just specul pure speculation. And then the other is, is primary. This is actual content. Um, and I didn't show a screenshot for obvious reasons. OK. So do, do the enumeration, do the crawl, look at everything. Um, we know what the costs are for each of all of the registrations, all this kind of stuff. And then we can just multiply everything out. OK. You get a table that looks like this. So we have these four categories of the intent for which people were, were doing the registrations the number of domains that were in that category, and then multiplying by the cost, the amount of money, the revenue that ICM registry received. OK, so impressively, 24 million to ICM registry just in the initial period for people defending their names. They are just minting money. All right? And then if you look at the recurring costs, these are the yearly, so the um, doing the reserve and um, sort of the, the initial registration where you pay $200 so that nobody else could use it forever. That's just a one-time cost. But the UCSD's case where they're doing the registry reg registered non-resolving, 
UCSD is paying $100 a year to ICM registry so that nobody else can register that domain. And the recurring costs for the revenue that is coming to ICM registry, less than 10% of it is due to people who actually have adult content in XXX. So it's just a scam. It's just a big scam. All right. So does XXX meet the unmet needs? Absolutely not. Huge scam. Whatever adult content is in XXX or is out on the internet, it's not in XXX. You have to go elsewhere if you want to find it. Um, but a huge cost to everybody else. So clearly, you know, a failure from the perspective of why it is that we might introduce a new, new TLD. Okay. So then we did it for all new TLDs that, so I can open up the process of registering for new TLDs in the January of 2012. Anybody could go out there and register a new TLD. We were really excited and we were starting the process when we realized that there's you know, a $200,000 cost for doing it, which is even too steep for us. Um, but anybody can do it. There are lots of different categories. It was very controversial at the time. The good is that it opens up vast new namespaces uh, beyond just the crowded.com. But of course, that might introduce confusion, add costs, result in legal battles, all this kind of stuff. So lots of debate about whether this was actually a good idea. So we wanted to sort of see, evaluate, you know, for all of these new ones, what is going on inside of the new TLDs. OK, what I'm going to do, so same methodology, roughly speaking, of XXX, except we can't go into as much detail because we have 500 TLDs in all of the hundreds of thousands of domains that are registered in all of them. OK. But I'll just sort of summarize what the results were. So do the new TLDs meet unmet needs? Well, clearly there's a demand for new TLDs. The fact that we now have 1,200 new generic TLDs, people were really excited about registering new TLDs. Um, it is expensive, and we developed a, um, a sort of a profit model for these, for these new TLDs. How, how many registrations do you need over how much time before you become profitable? And actually, um, it's not clear that the majority are actually going to be profitable down the line. So there has to be other reasons why they're registering these new TLDs. There was not a deluge of, of sort of lawsuits or confusion over domains spanning one TLD versus another. Certainly there are some organizations that are protecting themselves. Microsoft would be one of them. You register Microsoft.star and just do that. Um, customers are using them. So in the top TLDs, hundreds of thousands of new domains are being registered. And we did this um, machine learning analysis where we asked the question, is the content on the site of the domain registered in a new TLD related to the name of the new TLD? And when there is content, interestingly, 80% of the time it was. So for .New York, New York related websites, dot London, London related websites. So to that extent, actually, it seemed to be working out fine. But if you sort of look at all of the registrations, it is still the case that defensive dominates actual content. So only 15% of the domains that we were able to crawl had real content on them. The other were either defensive let's say redirects or something like that, or they were speculative. Lots and lots of parking out there in the, in the new TLDs. Uh, the 15% that, that, that's new, are, are they replicating content that's already on a .com or something, or, 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 or is it genuinely new, new, new? Genuinely new, new, new. So we tried to take an account for that if there was a redirect, or if it was similar to the dot .com version, then we'd say not new, yeah. So if I pay $200,000 to open a TLD, what kind of right do I have? Like, um, oh, okay. The so right thing. Yeah, okay. Players, yeah. yeah, so the business model is that as a registry, you're going to own a new TLD. Okay. Dot wait on. Okay. Now you will engage in business contracts with registrars like GoDaddy. GoDaddy will sell domains in dot wait on, and you get to set what the price is. I see. GoDaddy will take a, a sliver of every domain registration, and then um, you get the remainder. I can also gets a little bit too. Okay, um, and then, you know, this is still sort of the basis of ongoing work at looking at um, various kinds of abuse, but being able to do it now that we have all this infrastructure of being able to crawl sort of DNS at scale, uh, of looking at abuse in, in DNS at scale. 
I'm still surprised at how much Newton content there seems to be. Uh, uh, did you compare it against everything else, or did you compare it against things with the same name dot com? Um, so we compared it against the same name dot com. We also, at the time that we were crawling all of the new domains that we were appearing in the new TLDs, we also crawled new registrations in dot com to sort of see you know, what is the fraction of parked pages in the new TLDs relative to the new parked pages in .com, things like that. And it was absolutely the case that there was far more defensive and speculation in the new TLDs for new registrations relative to .com, um, relative to content. There was more new content was appearing in .com at the same time that some content was appearing in the new TLDs. And this, these percentages are for domains that actually had a web server respond to an HTTP request. So there are lots of doma registered domains in the new TLDs that don't resolve. Or there's some kind of error. Or there's a web error or something like that. This is just for where we actually had content and could look at it. All right, I'll stop there. Um, so this is still, you know, uh, an area in which we're, we're very active and working, not just sort of DNS abuse, but sort of current projects are looking at account compromise by attackers. You, could, you pay an attacker $100, you give them an email address, like victorball at microsoft.com, and then they will give you the password for victorball at microsoft.com. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ad fraud, looking at security outcomes, OSN abuse, um, phishing, um, looking at, you know, VPNs are now being advertised pretty, pretty heavily. It's like, do VPNs actually give you the guarantees that they advertise to give you? Are they, are they storing stuff and reselling? You know, interesting questions there. Um, yeah. All right. Are you going to include Facebook in that study? Because they're not offering a VPN service. We, um, you know, because for the privacy sensitive user who doesn't want, you know, their <laughs> online activity to be viewed by a large corporation. <laughs> Facebook already knows everything about you. So if you use them as a VPN, they're not going to learn anything new. So I mean, once you signed up, game over already. What is lateral phishing? Lateral phishing is I am able to um, fish an account in a company, and then based upon that fished account, then go and compromise other accounts or other, other um, servers. Um, so a, uh, it has become clear. So if you ever look at sort of the... Um, how, how breaches happen in practice. So if you were to sort of, let's say, be a legal consultant on a case where there are um, breaches uh, under, under dispute, um, the methodology actually is you just get a toehold anywhere in the company. And then once you get that toehold, then you become very clever in trying to then find the actual resources that you're after when you're compromising that, that site. And it's that. It's the lateral step that is, that is very much understudied that we're trying to get a handle on. Can you say something about online social network abuse? All right, so um, this is actually a, a project we just submitted to Usenix Security last week. Um, it's completely crazy. Um, I'm not an online OSN user uh, myself, but so, So imagine you have an online social network, and there are various metrics about your OSN account. How many people follow you? How many people like you? All this kind of stuff. OK. There are services out there that you pay them, and they will increase those metrics. And we're talking that in these services, you know, uh, you know let's say they're, they're making a lot of money from doing this, a lot, a lot of money. I have first-hand experience of that. My wife has a business, and uh, so I have a six and I how to do it and how bad it is. Yeah. So um, the goal of the project is to um, enroll in the services using Honeypot accounts, understand how it is that they work. Based upon that understanding, create essentially signatures so you can monitor at scale for the entire service. Look at how the service operates at scale. Look at how much money they're making, and then use that um, the knowledge gained to intervene and shut them down. 
And um, in this case, we actually looked at different interventions over time to see how services <coughs> react to different interventions. How about alerting on, like, there are services that use these, like, there are people who use yes. these services. And yes. so alerting that these people have used that service. Um, we did not go down that path, but that would be another, um, another way of tr getting more information about the, how the service works. Yes. Um, it's just amazing that yeah. the ecosystem that is built up around this on metrics that don't actually mean anything. So do you see uh, you know, all this chatter around password-less authentication? How, how do you see that space? And you know, after going forward, will passwords still continue to be the dominant way by which we? Unfortunately, yes. You would say yes? Yeah. I don't see passwords going away anytime soon. Is uh, that because the other schemes are too clunky, uh, uh, too expensive? Well, it comes back again to this, this usability question. Nobody wants security. Users don't want security. Sites don't want, don't want security. Attackers don't want security. Nobody wants security <laughs> um, because it only makes things more of a hassle. And it's this hassle slash convenience factor um, about uh, sort of two-factor authentication and, and things like that that I, I would say has, um, has limited the, the adoption rate of it. You know, if you're if you're if you're a small group creating your you know a site for other people to use, you just don't. That's not where you're trying to focus all your time. Um, now you can. One way in which you can sort of adopt it is that you can then let Microsoft or Google or Facebook authenticate for you, um, but then those companies get insight into your site as well. So there is a little bit of trade-off going on there. Um, but the. Um, Having the big sites authenticate for you for seems like the, the, um, the greatest hope for small sites adopting more sophisticated authentication techniques. They're not going to do it themselves. But yeah, passwords, I still see them, see them here for, for quite a while. All right, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it.